Today I'm starting to talk about the neoclassical growth theory. Um, in particular, this comes from Economics 201, Macro 1, which is the first part of the course, and Sessions 3 and 4. The element of the neoclassical growth model that I'm going to be talking about today is the production function, and then future videos will also look at the other elements of neoclassical growth theory. You would have heard of the production function before, and in economics we use the production function because it allows us to establish a quantitative link between the amount of inputs that go into productive processes and the amount of output that you then get. So it really is just a relationship between what you put in and what you get out. We would have previously dealt with an aggregate production function, and we can write the aggregate production function as follows. Y is equal to A, F, K, N. Note that it's all in uppercase or capital letters. The capital Y stands for total output. Capital A stands for technology. F is the mathematical operator. It demonstrates that this is a function of. Capital K stands for capital stock, total capital stock. And capital N stands for labor or the population size. And what this production function then allows us to demonstrate is that there is a link between what you put in and what you get out. So on the right hand side, if we were to increase the population size or increase total capital stock or even increase or improve technology, that would have an effect on the amount of output produced. Specifically, it would increase the amount of output produced. Now, in neoclassical growth theory, we don't deal with an aggregate production function. We instead deal with a per capita production function. So that's written slightly differently. And note the difference. It's all lowercase letters. And this um, per capita production function, lowercase y, refers to output per person. Little f is, again, the mathematical operator, is a function of and little k stands for capital per person. So what this per capita production function suggests is that changes in capital stock per person will change output per person. Increases in capital stock per person will increase output per person. Now if we just want to quickly look at the link between the aggregate production function and the per capita production function, note the following. Um, total output divided by the population size will give us output per person. So taking the total amount of output and dividing it by the size of the population will give us the left-hand side of our per capita production function, output per person. And taking the total capital stock and dividing it by the population size, that will give us capital per person or the right-hand side of our per capita production function. All right, so the purpose of now looking at the production function in per person terms is that we want to try and understand this per capita production function, and we want to try and translate it into a graphical representation so that we can link it to some of the other elements of the theory, which we'll talk about later in later videos. So bear with me while I go through a little example, because what we are wanting to try and understand is not just that there is this relationship between capital stock per person and output per person, but we want to know what that relationship looks like. When we increase capital stock per person, how does output per person increase? Is there a constant relationship between capital stock per person and output per person, or is it not a constant relationship? And if not, what kind of relationship is there? So I'm going to use a small example that will hopefully go some way to help you understand this. Imagine that you're a chef and that you have a small kitchen, and that that small kitchen is your fixed input. You produce meals for sale using variable inputs. And those variable inputs would be the ingredients that you need to cook the meal. And here, capital stock is also a variable input. And your capital stock could include things like your fridge, um, the stove top for cooking, um, as well as cooking utensils, etc. And you combine this fixed input, which is your small kitchen, your labor, which is yourself, 
and the variable inputs, the ingredients and the capital stock to produce meals for sale. Let's say that in the first instance you can produce 10 meals for sale. You then decide that this is great but you want to increase the amount of meals that you can produce for sale. And so to do this you're going to increase your variable inputs. You would probably need both more ingredients but we're also, for the sake of the example, going to suggest that you also increase your capital stock, which remember I said was a variable input. So in this case, you're going to increase the amount of um, space you have to cook by purchasing an oven, and that's going to allow you to also bake. So once you do all of this, that allows you to um, produce and sell 20 meals. So when you increased your ingredients and your capital stock, you were able to change the output per person by 10 units. So what we can see is you can get more output by increasing the amount of capital stock per person. Let's say that you want to increase your output even further, so you decide to purchase yet another stove. But now you're going to start running into problems, because where do you put the stove in your fixed input? You would have to have it installed, or maybe you don't, aren't able to do that, so you just buy a freestanding stove, and there it lies in the middle of your kitchen. That's going to make cooking and working around the stove very complicated. Even though you have an extra stove and can technically bake and cook more, it becomes cumbersome to do so because you have a fixed input, which is your kitchen size. So although you have this additional stove, and although you've increased your capital and probably increased your ingredients as well, you will be able to increase the amount of meals that you can produce, but probably by not, by not by as much as the first time you increased your variable inputs. So maybe this time you're only able to increase your variable inputs by perhaps, um, I mean, increase your outputs by about eight meals. So what you notice is that each time you increase your variable inputs, output increases, but not by as much as before. And we call this phenomenon the law of diminishing marginal returns. It tells us that output will increase as we add more inputs to a fixed input, but that output increases at a decreasing rate. What we now want to do is try and illustrate this in a graph. So to do that, the starting point is always to draw the axes of the graph and to label them. And in this case, what we are drawing is essentially the production function. And we need to label our axes on the horizontal axis. We're going to have capital per person. On the vertical axis, we're going to have output per person. So we label this capital per person, also sometimes known as capital per capita, also sometimes known as the capital to labor ratio. And on the vertical axis, we have output per person or output per capita. All right. Now, to draw this production function, which then exhibits the characteristics of diminishing marginal returns, it looks something like this. And we label that y is equal to f k, which is our production function. Note that it has a concave slope. And this concave slope is where the law of diminishing marginal returns is embodied. And it's through this concave slope that we're able to demonstrate that consecutive equal increases in the capital to labor ratio will result in output increasing, but at a decreasing rate. So. The best way to show the law of diminishing marginal returns on this graph is to literally draw in the changes in capital stock and map these against the changes in output per person that are going to take place. So we're trying to match up how capital stock per person changes and then how that affects the amount of output per person being produced. So let's just put in some labels. We start off at zero. Zero capital stock per person produces zero output per person. K1 amounts of capital per person produces Y1 amounts of output per person. K2 produces Y2. 
K3 produces Y3, K4 produces Y4. Alright, we now need to demonstrate how much capital stock per person is changing by. So what we note is that capital stock per person, because of the way in which I've labeled these axes, is changing by consecutive equal increases. What this means is that the amount by which capital stock per person increases between 0 and K1 is the same as the amount by which capital stock per person increases between K1 and K2, which is the same as the amount by which capital stock per person increases between K2 and K3. We can write that as follows. Um, K1 minus 0 is equal to K2 minus K1, which is equal to K3 minus K2, which is equal to K4 minus K3. So those are our consecutive equal increases in capital stock per person. If we now consider how output per person changes, when capital stock per person increased in the first instance, there was quite a big increase in output per person. The next time capital stock per person increased, output per person increased too, but by a smaller amount. Note that the difference between Y1 and 0 is bigger than the difference between Y2 and Y1. In other words, the amount by which output per person increased from the first increase in capital stock per person is bigger than the amount by which output per person increased from the second increase in capital stock per person, even though those increases in capital stock per person were the same. And we can continue and we can show that Y3 minus Y2 will be greater than Y4 minus Y3. Okay, so that then in essence is our per capita production function and there's some things that I need you to remember from this discussion. The first is that the per capita production function shows the relationship between capital stock per person and output per person. The second thing to note is that this relationship is positive. Increasing capital stock per person increases output per person. The third thing is that the um, production function embodies the law of diminishing marginal returns. This means that increases in capital stock per person will increase output per person but at a decreasing rate. What we will then be doing in future videos is using some of what we studied here but also extending it to consider how we can go about increasing capital stock per person. Essentially, the point that we've gotten to is to say, well, if we need more output per person, we need more capital per person. The question then becomes, how do we get more capital per person? And so the rest of the neoclassical growth theory model attempts to answer that question by considering not only um, savings, but also investment decisions that are made in economies.